joining me today for a quick tour here at Eastern New Mexico University. My name is Ivana Mali. I am the Associate Professor uh, and Wildlife Biologist here at the Department of Biology. And here, uh, I'm here today to give you a little bit, a little tour of a very unique place we have here on campus, and that is the Genero Natural History Lab Exhibit. So this lab exhibit has been around for nearly 50 years. It was established by Dr. Tony Gennaro back in 1971. So in 2021, we're gonna celebrate our 50th anniversary here. And the whole goal of, of the exhibit itself, we kind of put a, a three main objectives or, or three main mission statements. Uh, one is to increase the knowledge of the native flora and fauna of New Mexico, and also to increase the appreciation for our wildlife in this area. So when Dr. Gennaro established this exhibit, what he had in mind is specifically the region of Eastern New Mexico called Llano Estacado. So Eastern New Mexico and Northwestern portion of Texas. So majority of animals that you guys are gonna see today are actually native, native to New Mexico. And our third objective and kind of third mission statement is to perhaps encourage the local community to put into practice, to successfully put into practice some of the conservation ideas and concepts. So the exhibit is very important on three levels, really. It's important for local community, it is important for our students, and it's important for us as wildlife professionals to share our knowledge and to share our love for wildlife. Okay? So on any given day in a museum, what we have is, again, mainly our native species. So I'm just gonna show you a few from, from crayfish to bluegill to the red deer sliders, um, long-nosed gar, but we essentially have anywhere from thir 30 to 40 different species. Uh, when it comes to live specimens, we mainly focus on fish and reptiles and amphibians. So we currently don't have any live birds or any, any live mammals for obvious, obvious reasons. Um, so if we go further along and take a look at some of the other specimens, so we have some of our native fish species, um, that inhabit the Pecos River system, for example, the red shiner and Mexica te Mexican tetra. Maybe some of the species that, you know, you're not necessarily gonna get on a fishing line or anything like that, but are, are important parts of the ecosystem. If you walk around the museum, you will also notice that we're a little bit turtle biased. And I will have to admit this, uh, I took over the museum three years ago and I'm a herpetologist at training and specifically, I've been working on freshwater turtles for past 10 years. So we have a lot of different freshwater turtle species, such as the common snapping turtle and the yellow mud turtles here. Uh, and so one particular story I like to tell all of our visitors is um, we had this female uh, yellow mud turtle for, for a long time when Somebody came in and brought us a male mud turtle uh, about two years ago that they found just roaming on the street and was trying to, to save it. So we kept the male and we put them together. So if you guys, uh, if we look at the male over here, there is our male mud turtle that came in two years ago. And they immediately sort of hit it off. And we didn't know this was gonna happen. This was completely unplanned. But about a month or two months after they met each other, the female actually dropped some eggs in the water. And so one morning I walked in the museum and I see her tank with seven nice turtle eggs and I sort of panicked, right, because turtles come out on land to lay their eggs, um, but she didn't have clearly space to come out on land. So I quickly grabbed those eggs, we put in a little special substrate and we incubated it for about two to three months, not really knowing whether those eggs were viable or not. And sure enough, about Two and a half months later, we had seven baby mud turtles, okay? So some of them are still with us. Um, there's a little dude that I can take out later. He's hiding over there. But we had seven healthy babies, um, and most of those we did go give away to the local community, to people that have ponds um, or have tanks and they want some turtles. Um, and because these turtles are native to New Mexico, we felt comfortable to, to give these turtles away to the community. Um, if you come over here, you will see that we have uh, about seven different snake species as well. 
some of them um, that people are maybe not as fond of, but when people come to the museum, we really try to educate them on the importance right, of both venomous and non-venomous snakes for the ecosystem. So we have a Western diamondback crown snake. This snake is about six foot tall. He's been with us for a very long time. I call him our gentle giant. Uh, because he really is mellow for a rattlesnake, even when I'm moving him from tank to tank. And then we have our little moody one, and that's our prairie rattlesnake. So both, and especially prairie rattlesnake, is a quite common species of this part of, of New Mexico. Um, some other species of snakes that people may see on the road um, quite often, maybe after the heavy rains, would be the long-nosed snakes. Okay, so I'm going to pull this little guy. He seems curious. And if you guys notice, all of our tanks are locked, right? Uh, so this is a long-nosed snake, really pretty red and black alternative coloration. This is a non-venomous snake, really, really common to, to eastern New Mexico. So uh, if these were normal circumstances, this museum would be open to the public. Um, a lot of our students come through the museum to check out our animals. Uh, there's a lot of classes that we teach, both labs and lectures, where we like to bring the kids in and, and show them and teach them how to ID different species. So it's a very, very useful educational tool for us. And I feel that students also uh, appreciate it, especially, you know, ability to handle some of the snakes or some of the animals that are actually quite common to eastern New Mexico, but people may not see it on a daily basis. Um, and also, you know, a lot of other interesting educational facts. For example, if you come in, you can see uh, signs on our state um, fauna, right? What is the official state tree? Well, it's pinion pine, right? A lot of people don't know that. Or what is our state insect, tarantula hawk wasp? So we tend to educate people on our uh, state wildlife as well. Like state bird is a greater roadrunner, um, state mammal is American black bear, and so on. And so what we learn is students of all generations, whether it's middle school or high school or university, really enjoy learning about our state, state wildlife. And as I mentioned, as our third mission statement um, is to try to get the public to maybe even incorporate some conservation ideas into the daily practice, right? We have a lot of farmers, we have a lot of ranchers in the area that really care and enjoy wildlife, and they want to learn what can they do to make their wildlife on their land thrive. So for example, we have a little educational message about our iconic box turtles. Um, interestingly enough, the box turtles nationwide are on a decline. I mean, New Mexico, and especially eastern portion of the state, is one of the very few areas where box turtles are still thriving. Right? People tell me all the time, I saw a box turtle on the road, what do I do with it? Well, one thing we try to educate public on is, well, don't take it home, right? Help that turtle cross the road, but the pet trade, uh, and, and people taking them home, and road mortality is one of the main threats of our native box turtles. So we have a lot of research going on on box turtles here at Eastern, but we also try to educate general public about our quite iconic uh, animals of our uh, high plains ecoregion. We also have some preserved animals, and you guys are going to learn more about it from Dr. Pollock in a little bit. Uh, but we do tend to put out uh, in the exhibit some of our preserved animals, um, especially when it comes to birds and mammals, because we can't have birds and mammals, live birds and mammals, in the live exhibit. So people can learn a little bit about kangaroo rats, which are, again, very unique prairie species. You know, a lot of times when I, when I talk to our visitors, uh, a lot of people think, well, it's high plains. It's the grasslands. It's kind of a boring ecosystem. And I will argue to differ. Uh, uh, grasslands uh, compose you know, almost vast majority of the ecosystems across the planet. And they're also some of the least protected ecosystems on the planet. And grasslands are very diverse. There's so many different species of small mammals. There's so many different species of herpetofauna. 
New Mexico is the second most diverse state when it comes to the lizard diversity. So many, many different species of lizards we can see around here. And then we have some of our larger mammals here on a display, such as a bobcat, bison, and white-tailed deer, and also some of our birds of prey, hawks and, and owls. So it's a very, very good, uh, good kind of educational stop, not only for our fish and wildlife students, uh, but also for our local community. And just people, a lot of times I meet people here that just drive through Portales, but they heard about us um, through the grapevine and they just wanted to stop by and see us. So the museum is, is free. Uh, there is no charge to come in and we're hoping that next year we can reopen again to the public. Every year we have big, big tours of middle schoolers and high schoolers that come through. So we have thousands of visitors per year. Um, we have our students give the tours. Uh, sometimes I chime in. But that's a, a second important thing uh, about the, the live exhibit. Yes, it's educating the local community and the students, but we are, the museum essentially is student run. Okay? So every year we hire one to two work study positions. Usually these are the students uh, majoring in biology or wildlife and fishery sciences. So especially for our students, they maybe one day want to be work at a zoo or be a zookeeper. Um, get a very, very important hands-on experience with feeding the animals, with cleaning the tanks, with learning um, how to take care of their habitat in, in closed environments like this. So it's good for our community, it's good for our students, not very many schools and, you know, get to give their students such an opportunity to come and, and learn hands-on from the experts like me and like Dr. Pollock, like Dr. Craddock and Dr. Filburn about how to take care of, of, um, of the animals. Um, so let's see what else we have in the back. Uh, every now and then, we will have a non-native species here. Um, it, it's not on purpose, but every now and then we have visitors, we have somebody from local community that maybe doesn't want their pet anymore, and instead of releasing it back into the wild where they don't belong, we actually take them in. So one good example is the common musk turtle, you guys see here, and um, our peninsula cooter that you guys see here. So uh, these two are actually not found in New Mexico, but we had folks bring them in as sort of a unwanted pets. Um, so we do take them in. So when you come in, um, usually above each tank, what you're gonna see is the name of the species, a little description about that species. Um, so if the name of the species is in red, it means it's a non-native species. So that's why these two guys are, um, are in red there. But it's still, you know, it's a good educational tool to compare native species with some of the common non-native species. Another interesting story, I'll bring you guys over here, um, are these little guys, okay? We see one guy right here. I don't know where the second one is hiding. These are the Cuban tree frogs. They're non-native uh, non -native in New Mexico, but they're also non-native to the rest of the country. Um, so these are highly invasive species that found their way first to Florida um, through airplanes or, or people traveling or whatnot. Um, and these are actually pretty bad for, for uh, native ecosystems, especially in Florida. These guys can eat other frogs. Uh, these guys um, can reproduce and spread really fast. And so we don't really think, uh, you know, New Mexico is not very um, amphibian rich state, right? Because of the lack of the rainfall and so on. Um, but um, the Cannon Air Force Base gave me a call one day last year and said, we accidentally, two Cuban tree frogs made their way into our airplane from, I, don't, I think they were coming from Florida. Uh, what do you want us to do with them? And I said, well, definitely don't release them just anywhere. They're not native. They're not supposed to be in a US period. Why don't you just bring them to the museum? And so we can educate the public about some of the, the bad guys, <laughs> some of our non-native 
and actually invasive species like Cuban tree frogs. And they're thriving with us, they're, they're pretty happy. Um, so I think at the end of the day, everybody was happy that they're here. Uh, another one of my favorites are going to be these guys right here. We have a pair of tiger salamanders. This is uh, sort of a common amphibian species of this area, but you're not gonna see them unless you get a heavy rain and it's warm outside. So yes, we're getting some rain, but it's really cold, so nothing is gonna be moving. But about a year ago, we had a really, really heavy rain. I remember my street flooded, and these guys were everywhere. I've never seen so many tiger salamanders on the road. People were giving me phone calls, oh, do you guys need any tiger salamanders? I caught a tiger salamander. I was like, nope, got, got enough. Um, so these guys are here, these guys are quite common, but you know, depending on environmental um, uh, conditions on any given year, you may see them um, and you may not. Okay. Um, another bluegill, another one of our common, common species. And then the red ear slider. Uh, you know, the red ear sliders are maybe a little bit infamous because they are one of the most invasive species around the world. Um, and that's kind of rare for a turtle, for a turtle to be invasive. Um, and so they have been introduced on almost every continent except Antarctica. Um, so they can kind of mess up the, the native fauna if they're introduced somewhere where they're not supposed to be. But in New Mexico, the species is actually native to the Pecos River and the tributaries. Uh, it's not native to the, when you go west, it becomes non-native. So uh, there's some hybridization problems on the Rio Grande River, for example. But this little guy actually came from the Pecos River when I was doing some of my turtle research. And what we now know is that actually red deer sliders on the Pecos River are a little bit, not a lot, but they're a little bit genetically different than other red deer sliders in other river systems, uh, and morphologically even a little bit different. Um, yeah, so that, that's about all I have for you guys today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really, really hope that next year we can, we can reopen um, this museum to the public. There's just two more things I just remembered I wanted to add. Uh, something, I took over this museum about three years ago. And something we, that we did for the museum is we established a little gift shop, or what we called a donation station. So we have different stuffed animals, we have uh, some nature books, we have some really pretty wildlife photography that's, uh, with, with some level of donation, you in return get, get a gift. So with the, with the limited resources we have at Eastern, we do the best that we can, and we greatly appreciate any help from the public and, and our visitors. And something also we established be before COVID um, situation is every Friday, we actually open it to public to come in and feed some of our animals. So every Friday we would get five to 10 kids coming in hand feeding our box turtles, or hand feeding even some of our snakes. Uh, or hand feeding some of our other turtles, and they really, really seem to enjoy it. So I really hope we can we can bring that back. The next thing we established is what we call Adopt a Wild Child program. So if you are really fond of any of our animals in a museum and you want to adopt it, uh, with different level of donations for different species, you can adopt a wild child, and what you with that, what you can do is you can come and feed that animal, you can help, help clean the tank or help with the habitat enrichment. Um, and every week we would send that person a photograph of the animal and a little bit, little update on how are they doing. Um, and so we also have our Facebook page and uh, Instagram page. Um, so if you go to on Facebook to Dr. Gennaro Natural History Museum, or uh, Instagram, ENMU Gennaro Museum. Uh, we, we will um, keep you guys updated on what is going on at our um, exhibit and how our animals doing. Um, so thank you so much for being with me today and I really hope I can see you guys next semester. Thank you.